Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate. If you're enjoying the show, please tell your friends or your network about it uh, so we could spread the word and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating or review. It's greatly appreciated. In this episode, we have a great conversation with John Rittner. Uh, John just wrote a new book called Positively Irritating. We get into that, um, and then we get into his work uh, as a pastor at Ecclesia Hollywood and how we can embody good news to the city in which we live. Um, It's a fascinating conversation. John's a great communicator. You're going to really love this. So here is John Rittner. John Rittner, well, welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much, Joshua. Appreciate it. It's good to uh, make the connection. Look forward to talking. Yeah, it's going to be good. You know, as I'm, I'm looking at your story, it's pretty fascinating to me as your, you know, your journey went from a lot of different forms of, of church, a lot of different geographical locations. Um, yeah, let, walk us through your, your ministry journey uh, and what Jesus has taught you along the way. Man, yeah, it's been... It really has um, uh, really taken me all over the world, literally. Uh, I graduated from Trinity uh, Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago in 2012 and had just gotten married and went mm-hmm. back to my college town of Williamsburg, Virginia, yeah. and came on staff at a church uh, called the Williamsburg Community Chapel that um, was uh, kind of in the midst of a lot of growth and you know spent 10 years there. And Virginia's, you know, some will say it's not quite the Bible Belt, but it's definitely you know, in was in that Christendom culture where, yep. you know, the, the, the question you might ask a new person is, hey, you know, are you looking for a church? Can I help you? Yep. Uh, you know, or you might ask someone, where are you going to church? You would just expect church participation. And so I basically served for 10 years at a, a mega church. Eventually it was about 3,000 people wow. in that Bible Belt Christian culture, um, you know, running day-to-day programs for existing Christians in many ways. Um, yep. And, you know, but probably like a lot of attractional style churches, you know, the, the goal is to kind of fill the calendar with activities and hope that that was actually discipling people into the way of Jesus. And, right. and then hope that somehow the community would be interested in coming to participate in your programs and your services, you know. Mm. Um, and then in my own journey, I just began to kind of sense God stirring in my heart that what we were doing wasn't working. It, it yeah. wasn't reaching the next generation. You know, I came to Christ as a college kid. And always have had a college Bible study, you know, to kind of stay young and fresh and mm-hmm. to re reengage. Um, and I could just sense like our programs aren't connecting with them. They're not interested in church the way we're doing it. And right. yet they're they are interested in Jesus and they're interested yeah. in spirituality. In fact, they're actually more interested in maybe changing the world out there mm-hmm. than some of our church people are, you yeah. know. Um and so God kind of led us uh, one day in a staff meeting, a, a friend of mine who was a missionary in, in Europe was there sharing. And God gave me this whisper of, uh, you know, what if you could go to Europe, which was kind of the future of American culture in a lot of ways, yeah. this post-Christian, increasingly secular, post-church. Yeah. You know, what if you could go there and learn from these experimenters who are trying new things um, and then come back eventually to America and help prepare the modern day church for this mm-hmm. t- this era that's coming. And so we uh, we packed up and, and took our, our family of four over to Brussels, Belgium for three years and uh, basically went from leading a, a mic, I mean, excuse me, a, a mega church to helping plant little neighborhood micro churches yeah. in the city of Brussels, you know? And so if you're kind of familiar with that term, you know, there's little communities, 20 to, to 40 maybe that lived in a, in a geographic area. Yeah. And then we all came together once a month as kind of a, a citywide network mm. to celebrate what was happening in our different neighborhoods. So, yeah, I, um, I think that's, you know, that's fascinating. You, you're doing that in Europe as, you know, my day job leading all nations uh, as a mission agency, our goal is to go out and, and ignite church planting movements. A lot of times we go plant micro churches that multiply uh, around the world. And so this is, you know, this is where I live. The headspace that I live in yeah. is trying to figure that out. And as we've, we've done that, we've also been able to be here in a local church in Kansas City where we have changed the model of of church and we've given up our building. Uh, we've become 
uh, nomadic. We've split up into different house churches um, and we get together once a month to come as a corporate gathering. Um, and it's a it's a great model for authentic community as we're we're living things out. We're walking out our uh, relationship with Jesus. Um, what did you find while you were in that world in that mode as as maybe some of the the really good things that that brings and some of the things that uh, maybe we're missing? Yeah, you know, I I think the um one of the values of that, you know, people driven discipleship movement, right? So, you know, yeah. so much of the American church today has been making disciples through programs, professionals yeah. doing it in on a property. Um, but, but this idea of equipping everyday people to make disciples out in the ordinary spaces of life, you know, the places they live, work and play, you know, we talk about first, second, and third spaces. The, um, I think there's an incredible, um, spiritual formation that happens when you really engage with that, that missional incarnational, that sent life. You know, mm-hmm. one of the ways I phrased it is when someone else's spiritual maturity is partially dependent on you, you become more fully dependent on Jesus, right? Yeah. So it's not about inviting a friend to church so they can meet the pastor and hear him or her teach. Right. No, no, no. You, you are the missionary in that place. And so every day you are listening to the Holy Spirit, you're listening to the people you're serving, you're trying to discern what is good news? How do I embody it? What do they need? You know, how do I pastor someone? Well, man, that Mm. really can be overwhelming if you try to do it on your own, right? If you think, oh, I got in my own strength, I'm going to care for these people. And so what it does is it, I think it really drives you into the presence of Jesus to say, man, I am not the right person for this. And I don't have the right skills. And I don't even know if I want to do this today, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> but I believe you are, and I believe you are enough. And I believe you want to love these people. And so live your life through me, you know, that mm. John 15, like abide in me and, and, yeah. and let, let me just kind of represent you in this space. So I think that spiritual formation that is more of an activist or a a contemplative activist model where you're really like listening to the spirit and then engaging in his work is so much more transformational than the classic Greek classroom, maybe even American Bible study model, you know, where we just kind of sermon you and Bible study you to death, but never really have a way of measuring, are you living this out, you know? And so- um, you know, that the old idea that Mer- American Christians tend to be kind of educated mm. beyond their level of obedience <laughs> in, in Europe, what I saw was that people were activating beyond their level of training and then coming back to you going, okay, something happened. I didn't know what to do. Can you help me? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, which to me is very much right out of the Jesus disciple making yep. movement. Send these, send these men out who are ill-equipped and ill-prepared and, <laughs> trust that the Holy Spirit will join them. And then when they come back, debrief and say, hey, mm. what happened? You know, and, and let's uh, let's answer the questions that you now have as felt needs, you know? Yeah, and that's beautiful. I have one trainer that we uh, have really engaged with. And one of the things that he says is that people shouldn't get a new word unless they've obeyed the last mm. word. And uh, <laughs> it was a huge little paradigm shift of, you know, coming from America and coming from let's just give them all of the information and the education that they need all at once and just dump it on them. And hopefully that's going to transform their lives. Um, but if you're actually starting to walk out into obedience and then coming back, debriefing and then learning again and growing some more, it seems to be, you know, a good formation process. It's funny you say that, Joshua, because I've had this idea and I've never really had the courage to pull it off. And maybe (laughs) it's wisdom that I haven't tried or maybe it's just, you know, fear. But I've wanted sometimes as a pastor to come back, you know, on a Sunday and, you know, begin my message by reviewing last week's application and saying, hey, (laughs) last week we said to obey God's word, we were going to do this. How, you know, tell me who did it. Yeah. And and if the overwhelming majority couldn't apply it, then just say, well, you know what? I'm going to reteach that message (laughs) because we don't need a new word. We haven't applied last week's word, you know, but that's the pressure I think we all feel in this American industrial, uh, you know, disciple making system is every week I have to have something new and all the pressures on me. And yet the average Christian 
often feels the freedom to just kind of consume it intellectually without any sort of accountability, you know? And, yep. and so I will say the micro church experience provides a lot more accountability because you, you're all up in each other's business, so to speak, each yep. week. You're, you're often living life together. Not, you're, it's not just a worship gathering. We would have what we called serving uh, communities and then friendship communities or expressions mm-hmm. was the term we, you know, so we'd have one night we were hanging out in the pub trying to, yeah. you know, live out there and do pub quizzes or beer tastings or something to add value. And then often we would have some sort of a serving expression at a local partner uh, charity where we were going to add value there. Well, you know, that's three touch points during the week as well as wow. just, yeah. you know, other interactions that you'd have. So that was a, a micro church on mission together seven days a week. You can yeah. find out pretty quickly who's all in and who's just wants to, you know, check yep. a box on, on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Definitely. You can find out who's all in. Did you find and when you were in Belgium, were you um was it really affinity groups that you were working with? Was it people that, that knew each other that formed a microchurch? Or was it, uh, you know, neighborhood-based? How did... Yeah, you know, we honestly, in three years, we experimented probably with all of that. And, and you know, we would have our leadership teams go away in a retreat, and we would kind of say, hey, we feel like the spirit's, you know, blowing. Let's try something different. So there was one season where we had a lot of young families. And so we said, man, that's kind of a unique need. So let's actually, rather than go geographic, let's put the families all together. Um, They they preferred to meet on a traditional Sunday morning because of their family life. And then some of the young singles were meeting at, you know, eight or nine at night in in public spaces. Yeah. Um, They they didn't want to get up at 10 o'clock, you know. Um, And then, and then we broke that down for a while and said, no, no, let's go back to the original vision, which was more neighborhood based. Yeah. And so you may only have like my my kids didn't really have any peers um, when our gatherings yeah. came together. But what they had was a lot of intergenerational mentoring opportunities. They had adults who took interest in them, you know, yeah. uh, and so we decided, well, that has value as well. So, you know, yeah, I mean, we did uh, a lot of our outreach stuff was more affinity groups. So if we were going to form mm-hmm. a community. Yeah. Um, it would be in a, a location like a pub and try to figure out how do we add value to this pub or it was around artists, you know, so I remember we had a, a jam session, um, that would go every Thursday night and it was in a neighborhood in a set place, yeah. but it tended to attract musicians from around the, the city who started to hear about it and wanted to participate, you know? So I think the big thing that we kept saying was like, there is no model. The only kind of, the only church we're doing is contextual church. You know, so as long as you can make an argument that there's a context that we need to embed in, yep. then then let's try it, you know. And, yeah. and the other thing that did was it allowed a lot of freedom for people to begin to discern their own sense of calling. Mm. You know, what is what is my contribution? And so yeah. if you came with a passion for something, we'd say, hey, how do we equip you to do that? You know, I think you hit on something really important there, and it's following the lead of the Holy Spirit and not being tied to a model. Um, and yeah. we're actually tied to, hey, Jesus is the center of what we do. Um, we want to love and obey him. And out of that overflow of what we're doing, we actually see different expressions uh, here in the city of what we're doing so that we could see the city yeah. flourish uh, as what kingdom life is supposed to be. Um, and so I think that's a huge point and a place where, you know, I've seen a lot of, of local pastors in the United States where all they're doing is like on their hamster wheel. They're trying to keep it going, keep it spinning because they have all these these programs. They need to fill the building space. They need to do all sorts of different things. And so they probably have the freedom to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't seem like they do uh, to them. Yeah. And, and Joshua, the, the thing I think, you know, you and I as white men have to be honest about is when you have a a set model, often your model is targeting uh, a majority culture and then asking everyone who doesn't fit into that majority Mm. culture to adjust to what you're doing. And so as we, I think, become more of a, a, a globalized world, right. Where we're, there's a lot more immigration and travel. And while we honestly, you know, the browning of America as, as the, the white experience is being decentered as the primary experience. And I think that's a healthy thing. You, we have to recognize that it's going to take a lot of different 
um, contextual expressions of church to yep. reach the diverse, you know, human or American experience mm. that we have. And, yeah. and again, when you have held all the cards of power for so long, power and privilege, it's very hard to lay those down and to yep. lay down the natural advantages that you've had. Um, but I think if you look around, you, you, you see that this is actually one of the things that's held the church back. And yep. it's given us kind of a negative reputation is that we mm. we haven't done that. We haven't held our power and service of others. We've held it in a way that has served us mm. and whoever the us is in the dominant culture. And, and traditionally, that's been kind of the white, rich, you know, male. Yeah. Right. And so so that's part of my journey, too. And honestly, I, I was exposed to that through my time in Europe. I had my own kind of racial and ethnic cultural awakening yep. as I served alongside, you know, Persians and Africans and and even, you know, uh, Europeans from different experiences and realized that my experience of the world was not their experience. And yep. even my the way I engaged the city, there were certain advantages that were being afforded to me that they didn't have, even yeah. though we had similar status, you know, um, and, yeah, and that really kind of shook me up, and and I had to do some kind of rethinking and repenting around this, you know, the the structures that I had created in my mind. Yeah, and I, I've gone through a process where you know, for for a time, I go, I am a you know, I'm a white male. I have a lot of power, and I could walk through the world the way that I want to walk through the world. And so I've been through a time and a season where I've stepped back a little bit and not knowing how to engage because I don't want to offend or I don't want to, to really walk in somebody else's shoes that I'm not supposed to be walking in. And it was hard. But I heard recently somebody else on, on, on this podcast said that that power is the capacity to bring capacity. Um, and for mm. me, that really, really helped me out saying, actually, I do have the capacity to bring capacity towards other people and for other people. And I'm working for the good of others instead of working for the good of myself. Um, and if I walk in that and in that sense, um, there's all sorts of incredible empowerment things that I can walk into. Um, and that really helped me out. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. Um, so as you you went from what made you decide to go back to the U.S. and L.A. specifically, um, and how did that work out for you? Yeah, you know the the original sense of calling that we had was always that um, this was going to be like a, a short term trip into the future. You know that mm -hmm. it, that 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 there was a a return um, in order to share the lessons that we were learning with the people back home, so to speak. And, and I think initially we thought maybe that was actually back in Virginia where we yeah. were, we, you know, we kept our house and stuff like that. But eventually we began to sense, no, we actually want to go to a, a city that is experiencing mm -hmm. this post-Christian culture and it, where it's already dominating, you know, yeah. not where it's a couple of years off and you have to convince people it's coming, but we want it to be in a space where the existing church was sensing, man, there's a huge shift and we don't quite understand it. And so, um, as we began to just kind of be open at the towards the end of year two and, and into year three, um, you know, through some relational connections, uh, someone reached out to us who was trying to hire for this church here in Hollywood, California. And, and as I began to hear their experience, I realized, man, Hollywood is, you know, <laughs> kind of the epitome of post-Christian culture in terms yeah. of what what the American church even thinks of as like you know, uh, the, the secular influence, right? right? Oh, Hollywood. I mean, I'll hear people say, oh, I didn't even know there were churches in Hollywood, you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, there's 60, trust me. They're everywhere, you know? But but just that impression that Hollywood is a mission field yeah. um, and 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 the recognition that um, for, the, for the people in my community here now at Ecclesia that I'm pastoring for six years, they know there is no institutional credibility in the church anymore in their world. Mm. You know, there is, yep. they are rubbing shoulders every day in studios and on set and in writing rooms with people who have no interest in attending a Sunday worship service yep. and don't actually think that the institutional church is a source of good news and culture. Mm. They yep. see it actually as a source of bad news, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's anti-science or anti-gay or judgmental or hateful or whatever man, they are not interested in that. And so right. if if we're going to fulfill the mandate to make new disciples, these followers of Jesus who are artists and creatives 
they know that there has to be a strategy that can't begin with, oh, I'm going to invite them to church because that the invitation is that that tool just doesn't work anymore, you know. And so what I was so excited about was, oh, this is what I've been learning for Mm. three years in Europe is what do you do when the invitation no longer has, you know, any attractive pull, so to speak? How do you actually invert that pipeline and and Mm. don't lead with a worship service that then forms community and turns people into, into yeah. you know, living on mission. But how do you lead with mission? How do you actually mm-hmm. go where they are and embrace the sentness of every disciple? Mm-hmm. And so as I was just kind of sharing that with with this search team, they were thinking, oh, we want to learn. I said, well, I don't have the answers, but I, <laughs> but I want to be part of a community that wants to experiment together. You know, yeah. and so um, it's been a great six years of experimentation wow. and you know, in failure, but also a lot of learning and a lot of yeah. successes. And so um, that's that's what my kind of latest season of life has been mm-hmm. out here in Hollywood. That's good. I, I remember, uh, I think a couple of years ago, I watched uh, the your food truck church video. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I was really fascinated with that analogy. Uh, can you expand on that? What is that analogy and what does it look like? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things you learn pretty quickly when you're working with artists is that the power of story and image and metaphor, you know, um, is often what speaks to people's hearts. And so I was trying to figure out how do you communicate this new paradigm mm-hmm. um, to my church, but then also to the to others who would be interested in joining our mission. And, you know, we ended up kind of thinking through the old way of church in the American system as kind of a restaurant church, you know? So a restaurant is a brick and mortar place that has a good reputation, has a a professional chef, sometimes even a celebrity chef. There's a a trained group of employees who are very specific in what they do. One's the host, one's the waiter, one's the chef. Um, And, you know, they hang up a sign and people are willing to come try their food. And if their food is good, they, they gain an, an audience and they grow and maybe even they, they franchise and expand or at least mm-hmm. they build a, you know, a larger building. Um, and in many ways, that's what the American church has been like yeah. in the 70s, 80s and 90s. You know, if you got a, a great speaker and if you created a cool vibe and if you served a good meal, um, more people came um, and they, so many came that you had to keep expanding. Right. But but in you know, we've all had restaurant experiences where you hear about a restaurant that all of a sudden, you know, they were all into the the, the cool trendy dish, but now nobody wants that anymore. Yeah. Or a restaurant <laughs> that, you know, uh, had a crime committed in it or a restaurant that had, you know, got a, an F health inspector rating. And everyone's like, I am never going to that place again. Yeah. Right. Well, what's that restaurant supposed to do? How do they fulfill their mission if no one is willing to come? And so, you know, the analogy we kind of used was that's a little bit of what's happened. So, What if the church didn't think about running a restaurant, but what if the church existed more like a fleet of food trucks? Mm -hmm. You know, what if we reimagined ourselves in a new paradigm as small teams that were sent out into different nooks and crannies Mm -hmm. of the culture, you know, that, that, you know, set up shop, so to speak, and then served a very contextual gospel meal, you know, Korean hot wings, you know, lobster rolls, uh, you know, fish tacos, something that was unique and intriguing yeah. um, that that would draw people in. And then we actually um, became part of that neighborhood for the day or part of that people group for the day and kind yeah. of tried to fit in. You know, we're here to serve you, so to speak. Um, and then at the end of the day, all those food trucks in L.A., and they're all over, right? But they tend yeah. to park at a, at a food truck hub or what's sometimes called a commissary. Hmm. And so this idea that you go out and then you come back and when you come back, you all park together. And often what they do is they debrief. They celebrate mm. the wins. They, yeah. they say, hey, you know, did they're not competing because they were in different neighborhoods. Yeah. You know, um, and then usually they, they're part of a membership of this hub commissary where they can restock on paper products and food at discounts, mm. you know. Yeah. And so we said, man, what, what if the rhythm of our church was more like food trucks that went out during the week, yeah. partnered together in small teams, served others, cared for others, and then came back together on a Sunday and shared stories and mm. got re- refueled in the presence of the Spirit and celebrated the wins and grieved the losses. Yeah. And then we figured out what are the tools they need that we can give them so they can be successful this week. How do they restock yeah. in the presence of our community? You know. So 
Um, so that, that analogy started resonating. And so then, you know, the video yep. you saw, we, we found people in our community who were <laughs> artists and voiceover actors and a producer and a director. And just our community created kind of a little wow. three minute explainer video um, yep. that, that we use on our website and, and other organizations have used to kind of just paint this picture of maybe a new way of thinking about church. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. What is, uh, some, how does it look practically uh, for you as the church to really be this, these food trucks during the week? What does it look like practically? Yeah, so, you know, as everyone knows, COVID is such a, a, a wrench in all this, and what anything looks like in COVID is, is kind of crazy, right? But yeah. what I will say is um, going into COVID, we were at a, a place where we were becoming more of this hybrid style. So we recognize that um, you're not going to shut down the restaurant overnight and, yep. and mobilize everyone into food trucks. But we were beginning to identify some pioneers, some innovators and early adopters who wanted to experiment with mm -hmm. these new ways of being. And so we were equipping them while still running the restaurant, but yep. even within the restaurant casting vision for it, you know, and so um, we we probably had about four or five different food truck expressions that were happening during the week. Mm -hmm. The one that that I see most often is a co-working space for independent artists that we call Epiphany Space. And it yeah. was a, a nonprofit formed by one of our Ecclesia community members who who recognized that if you're an independent filmmaker, writer, actor, this city is incredibly lonely. Most people move here to follow the dream. They have no family. Um, you know, you're in your car often, you know, it mm. doesn't have those natural connection points like many cities do, you know. Yeah. Um, and so she wanted to, to care for people and help them flourish as artists by creating collaboration moments. And so, yeah. um, she created this epiphany space and then our staff offices, we actually decided to kind of embed in there. So the, our six person staff just took over, <laughs> you know, one of the rooms as yeah. like a, a, a subscriber because we want to help be missionaries there. Yeah. Um, and you know, th this weekend they've got a, a short film festival going on. They do. Wow all sorts of uh, writing workshops and songwriter events. Uh, and then they also have, you know, an ongoing kind of prayer group. And every now and then they'll have kind of a spiritual study group, you know, Life of Jesus or a, a book. Um, and so if people are interested in that, they can participate. Um, but really the fruit is often coming from seeds that are planted in just ongoing conversations, you know, yeah. over, uh, coffee out outside on the patio or on our wine Wednesday happy hour that we do, you know? Yep. Um, and we've seen, we've seen people make decisions to follow Jesus who were not interested in coming to a church and we never invited them yeah. to church. <laughs> you know, we, we sent the church there, so to speak, you know? Yep. Um, and so similar expressions, you know, a guy who, um, wanted to care for a, a specific corner of LA where homelessness had really gone mm -hmm. rampant and he began going there every week. And so we helped him recruit a team and, you know, over the course of two years, you know, they kind of emptied that corner out. He helped some of them get jobs. He, mm. you know, um, you know, just walked with them relationally. Uh, we did a big Christmas clothing drive for that one community. Um, but again, the, the thing that we've learned is the starting point is often talking with someone about, how is the spirit forming you and leading you to serve mm. this city? It's not, yeah. we've got a, a mission or a project or you have to do it in this way. It's, we want to come alongside you. We want to equip mm. you, you know? Um, and so if you have some area that you're passionate about, let's help you figure out what would it look like to help that part of LA suck a little less, mm. you know, <laughs> which is something I, I say in a book, <laughs> we use that phrase. What, what sucks in your life, you know, does it suck for anybody else? And could you work together to make it suck less for everybody? You know, and so that, sometimes perfect. that connects with, with non-church people. They go, yeah, I like that. I want to make it suck less. <laughs> yeah, I do want to make the, the world suck less. Of course I do. That's good. So what was your purpose? Uh, you wrote this new book, uh, Positively Irritating. What was the purpose of that book for you? What do you want to see it accomplish? Yeah, the... Um, you know, what I re recognized as I came back from Europe to America and what we were doing in Hollywood was I, I sensed a lot of churches and a lot of church leaders um, recognizing that what they were doing wasn't working anymore the way it did in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Yeah. But they just didn't know what else to do. 
Yeah. You know, their their brain was kind of fixed on a, a certain way of doing church, and they were struggling to find, um, you know, imaginative ways to mm. to um, reshape that. And so I realized, gosh, my journey actually of kind of deconstructing my church model and and entering into liminality, crossing over this threshold where I didn't have all the answers, and yeah. I had to reassume the position of a learner um, and experiment again. And then coming back to America and beginning to try out what we had learned, man, this is not a bad pathway. You know, yeah. it's not a, it's not a plan. It's not a, you know, fail proof if you, these four steps, but, <laughs> but the journey we've been on is a journey that is connecting with leaders as I yep. would share it. And so, um, you know, the analogy that I use and, and where the title positively irritating comes from is just that, you know, the post-Christian world has become an irritant for most churches. Yep. It is it is something that's bugging them, mm. that's bothering them, that they kind of wish would go away. You know, I wish we could go back to the good old days where yeah. everyone went to church on a Sunday and, you know, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, there were never any youth sports or, you know, any of the, right. whatever their memory <laughs> is of how the church was centered. Um, and so if you think about the power of an irritant, we tend to think of it as negative, but um, the same grain of sand you know, mm-hmm. that gets in your eye at the beach and causes an irritation and drives you crazy. It makes you rub and rub and rub and want to get rid of it because, you know, if it doesn't, it'll lead to, you know, infection. Yeah. That same grain of sand can get into, you know, the mantle or the bed of an oyster. And the oyster's response is not to try to eliminate it. It's to actually embrace it. And as mm-hmm. the oyster embraces this irritant with, you know, layer upon layer of this substance called nacre, it ends up creating a pearl. And so the point mm. is, and the, that irrit- the irritant is not the issue. It's the yeah. response to the irritant. And that your response as an organism reveals actually how healthy you are. <laughs> and so, you know, as a church, and then of course COVID came out, uh, COVID was breaking <laughs> into the world yeah. right as we were in our final draft. And so we thought, oh my gosh, it's another irritant <laughs> that we have to face. Yeah. And so it, the timing be, really was um, providential because a lot of people were, that was the primary irritant they were thinking about. Well, yeah. how do you embrace the irritant to make something beautiful that you can then give to the world as a gift? Yeah. You know, my, fav- my favorite part of that analogy is that it's in our culture today, it's not the oyster that enjoys the pearl. It's, it's the human, you know, the, the, the oyster made the pearl and then the pearl became a blessing for others. Hmm. And so how do we, how do we create something of beauty that the world will enjoy, not just our church people? Yeah. Have you seen any examples of that during COVID that you've actually seen people embracing the arid sense and making something beautiful? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of our community is recognizing, um, the value of, um, living locally and, and really going Mm -hmm. like, well, I'm not driving all over LA anymore, you know, especially in COVID. I wasn't going anywhere. I was shopping at the one store, um, you know, and it took an hour to get there and, you know, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, all you really had was kind of neighbors around you. And, you know, what I loved was watching people say, let's create these kind of COVID pods or, you know, everyone Mm -hmm. had different language for them, you know, little, we, you know, we, we talked about even forming kind of like trios, but, basically another family or two that you'd be safe, you feel safe with, you know? Um, And so I I feel like there were a lot of neighborhood relationships that Mm. were deepened and formed, which are leading to, you know, relational disciple making um, that, that people just walked right by their apartment. One of the ironies of big city life that I'm learning from being here in LA is because you're around people all day. Yeah. If you live in an apartment, the apartment is the last place you want to be engaging with people. That's like your safe space. So the minute you get out of your car and you get in the elevator and you walk the hallway, it's almost like, Oh, I don't want to talk to you neighbor. (laughs) This is my space. And so it's the opposite of suburban life where your neighbors become the people you might want to interact with because you might have been scooped up all day alone, you know? And, and so this kind of flipped it. We all actually felt like, oh, I'm not seeing people all day. And so I remember, you know, we got to know our neighbor who was outside playing guitar every day at three o'clock. Yeah. And we just walked out as a family and said, hey, what's your name? We love your guitar playing. And I'd never met the dude yeah. until until COVID, you know. Um, so just, you know, I think that that's one picture that, that uh, our family kind of was noticing was, man, this is actually – uh, creating a better rhythm of local living than than we had before. Yeah, what's the 
as as you're trying to to make disciples that go out and and make new disciples um, and actually are transformed from the inside so that they could mm. impact the community and the culture around them. Um, there's there's a couple things. One is it seems very complex within a city because there's so many different challenges uh, in a major city like L.A. Um, how can people and, and disciples go and impact the culture around them and even have a hope to transform a, a big major city like L.A.? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you a story because it's um, – it was eye-opening for me. One of the um, we, we started something called missional imagination workshops at Ecclesia. Uh, they were basically um, uh, post Sunday worship service experiences that we invited people to to join if they were interested in engaging their neighborhood as a missionary. And we were seeing kind of seventy percent of our worship attendants come over. It was amazing. But wow. one of the first. And then we would gather in neighborhoods and to try to introduce people to someone, again, L.A. neighborhoods, meaning at least <laughs> five miles from each other, not, you know, not the yeah. same cul-de-sac. But, <laughs> um, but we did an experiment one time, like a, an imagination um, uh, ex- uh, event or what I call it, activity or something, where I told them, um, imagine that the, your team of eight people sitting in a circle is going to go live in a biodome. And you're going to go live in this biodome for three years, you know, and your job is to cultivate the ground and establish rhythms of life. And, you know, everyone will have a role and all that kind of stuff. But I want you to imagine forming a church in that biodome and with the eight of you as the starters, you know, Um, Hmm. what would that look like? What would you do? Come up with a strategy, come up with um, tactics, uh, what roles you might play. And we gave an hour to come up with it, right? Yeah. And of course, the irony is when we, when everyone reported back, nobody led with, oh, well, we'd find a building, uh, we'd hire a worship team, we'd figure out who plays guitar, none of that kind of yeah. stuff. No one even said we'd pick a pastor. What they all basically said was we'd probably just gather, you know, in, in our homes and then begin to serve others and stuff. Uh, and so people had incredible strategies of how to add yeah. value to the biodome, right? And at the end, I said to them, um, you know, this is what it means to start a food truck. This is what it means to be a church planter. It's to, you know, just yeah. simply uh, w- why, what keeps us from doing this in LA? And I'm telling you across the room, people jumped right on it. And they said, hmm. here's the thing, John, you told us we would be in one space for three years. That's not true in LA. We have no idea if we're going to live in the same house or apartment for three years. People are moving wow. all the time. Number two, you told us we were going to be working with the same people, those eight people for Mm. three years. There's no guarantee that's going to happen. And number three, because you put a a dome over that location, (laughs) the the missional context we were in was was very defined. And they said the L.A. life is perpetual moving around, Mm. always gaining and losing friends and a massive footprint that you live in, where you work here, live here, play here. Yep. And that was such an eye opener for us because I realized yeah. we have to create more micro environments. You know, you can't even say, I'm going to reach Hollywood. I'm going to reach Burbank. I'm going to yeah. reach Warner Brothers. It's too big. Yeah. You know? Um, and so how do you create longevity? You know, how do you create sustainability? Mm. Yeah. It begins much smaller. And to be honest, Joshua, the, the big challenge that we're finding right now is, the history of our church was, you know, Ecclesia was, you know, 700 people, attractional commuter drive from all over the city yeah. because you were in the entertainment industry. And so kind of the remnant that I have left after those days are long gone for them. Yeah. And I came after a lot of that fallout, but the remnant you have left don't live in proximity with other quote unquote Ecclesians. Mm. They, they're the only ones within their, their neighborhood. And so they don't, they're not going into a biodome with eight other people. And so they feel very isolated and alone. And so, you know, Mm. we've talked about maybe we need, you need to discern who else, you know, loves Jesus, but attends another faith community, another church. Maybe you need to figure out, you know, who doesn't care about Jesus, but cares about the cause that you care about, Mm. you know, Um, they may not, they may not want it for the reason you want it, but they, they, you know, their why may not be the same, but their what might be the same. And that's okay. That's a starting point. They want to bless the school, you know, or they want the school to be safer. Hey, that's fine. Yeah. You know, so 
it's led to a lot of, I mean, I, I share that analogy just because I think that I go back to that biodome thing a lot because my people had no problem being creative in a biodome. They knew how to do it. Yep. The, 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 the issue is LA is not a biodome. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. And I think that's across the, the board, across the world in major cities. This is what we're, I think everybody's trying to figure out. Um, what does it look like, especially in a migratory community? Um, and, you know, you have different people coming in and out all to- all the time. You know, in a rural community, you have a stable, stabilized village of people that stay there yeah. and form community. And that community is its own little culture. But there are so many different cultures in a major city. And not to mention now there are so many different uh like worldwide cultures that we have people from all over the world that are coming into our city. And yeah. so immigrants and, and refugees, and there's all sorts of challenges in a city. And so it actually says, Hey, Holy spirit, what are you doing? How can we join you? Um, give us the answer. And, you know, for me, a lot of people ask me how they could pray for all nations, our mission agency. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I ever tell them is, I want to hear from Jesus and do what he says, um, because mm. I can't come up with strategy to reach every single nation that we're in, or I can't come up with a strategy to reach Kansas City or at, Jesus has to do it. And the Holy Spirit in me who's given me discernment and wisdom has to do it. So that's I need to listen and then obey. And so what sort of a posture do you do you need in that? city uh, to be able to make a, a, an impact and an influence? How can we posture ourselves as disciples of Jesus in the world um, so that we can make an impact in a way where we're so busy and we're just like hey, doing so many things? We often think that hey, yeah. ministry time is uh, we can't do it because we're too busy. So how do we posture ourselves? Yeah, it's a great question. And as some, you know, again, I did 10 years of ministry in a very suburban uh, environment. And now having done the last nine years in these two urban environments, yeah. I think I'm realizing that the, the, the posture of spirituality is very different. And in the suburban environment, um, I often felt like my role as a pastor was to try to catalyze behaviors, catalyze engagement with the the world around, you know, Mm. kind of this ministry of engagement that, hey, people were looking for meaning in life. You know, they were a a lawyer or a restauranteur or a chef. They kind of like, well, yeah, that's my day job, but I don't really know what I'm doing to make an impact in the kingdom, you know? And so, and they'd give big to a building program because they felt like at least they were contributing to something bigger than themselves. And so, and so if you, if you led uh, you know, whether it was street evangelism or mission trips or, you know, um, a caring for a, a nonprofit, people love joining you because they wanted to engage in order mm. to experience Jesus more because the mundane life, they didn't experience Jesus, right? Yeah. The temptation for me then was when I went to an urban environment to think, all right, so my job is to give people more activities mm. so they could experience <laughs> Jesus. The irony of an urban environment is most people who are willing to make the sacrifice to live in an urban environment, they are already there living Mm -hmm. in small homes for less money in cramped environments because they have a sense of calling Mm -hmm. that put them there and and they they have to be there to fulfill their calling. So think about Hollywood, right? I mean, someone feels called to tell stories, to be an artist, to create beauty. They know Hollywood is where I have to go to do it. Now, if they've moved here, the cost of living is insane. The taxes are nuts. You know, you can't uh, afford uh, to buy a home. Um, You're stuck in your car all day. Yes, there's a lot of sunshine, but they're making a lot of sacrifices in order to already fulfill their calling. And so there's not a lot of margin in their life. So Mm. what they're actually longing for and the posture that I'm trying to, you know, kind of speak to them is more of a posture of disengaging Hmm. from the rat race of the world. Yeah. And, and, and a sustainable posture of sabbath and rest and Mm. stillness and listening you know Mm. it's not saying hey you know you got to get out there and do more for the kingdom it's saying you're already out there 
trying to embody Christ in the kingdom, but that you will not be able to sustain that if you're doing that 24 seven, you know? So like we, we did a whole series on Sabbath and it yeah. just, people really resonated with it hmm. because they, the world, the Hollywood world is all about the hustle. Yep. It's not about taking a day of rest, <laughs> yep. you know? And yeah. so, you know, I had guys even, you know, saying, listen, if I don't drive Uber on my quote unquote Sabbath day on my day off from my other job, I don't know if I'll pay the bills. And I remember one guy saying, I'm going to trust God in this hmm. and deciding to not work a second job or for him, I think it was actually a third job on his Sabbath wow. and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to try to lean into Jesus and listen to the spirit and, you know, go out in nature and then watching God provide for him, you know? Mm. So that's good. It's, um, it's ironic, right? Yeah. You think, oh, we want to make, we want to see impact, tell everyone to do more. And yet you realize actually for sustainable impact, there has to be that rhythm of breathing in and breathing out and saying, Hey, hey yeah. we're doing less, you know? Uh, so I, I met with a guy the other night who is a, a, a filmmaker and during COVID, one of the practices he's got into is, is this school of, of deep recovery breathing that was founded by this guy named Wim Hoff, who is a, a mountain climber and an extreme diver. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot going on out here now in this, world of not just meditation because that has kind of negative connotations but right. i would say mindfulness and breathing and yep. stillness that really it's believers are using it as a way to root themselves in the presence of god yep. you know there's you know get off your phone i mean this is the liturgy the liturgy of our world today is our phones yep and so we've got to disconnect from that in order to you know be be mindful of jesus mm. so that we can then join him in what he's doing yeah I mean, we have so many people right now on our staff and my friends that we are really trying to lean into Sabbath rest. And this is the mm -hmm. conversation that we have now. Just last weekend, my wife and I went on an anniversary trip. We were coming back and we were talking about our Sabbath and what we can do to be more intentional in Sabbath. And during that conversation, there was all sorts of identity issues that came up and there was resentment that came up. There was all like junk that was in our souls that I think was yeah. a spiritual attack of saying, this is not good for you. You need to still go out and hustle and your identity is is in what you do, not in who you are and who God says you are. Yeah. And it was, you know. I actually, I had that realization halfway through our conversation, which was healthy and good. And it wasn't like a week later. So it was, it was good. It was right there and say, Hey, let's reorient j j even this conversation and know that this is an important thing that we're doing and heading into. So we really have to take this seriously. And it's not just a flippant thing. Let's get a little time of rest. And then so that we could do more activity later there's something really important and special about Sabbath. Yeah. And, and, you know, we all know there are demons in that darkness, right? Yep. There, I mean, there, there are ghosts in that, in that quietness. And so, um, so much of our, our Western culture that is about perpetual energy and accomplishment and achievement is, you know, um, is partly, I think, to keep us from the pain we feel when mm -hmm. we stop and be quiet, you know, yeah. and the contemplative voice. And so, you know, I love Alan Hirsch talks about this idea of kind of being the contemplative activist, you know, mm -hmm. balancing, holding those intention, you know, so I, I think about that as the, the breathe in, breathe out rhythm of life, you know, yeah. I have to re renew and refuel and restore. And then I offer something that the world needs and in, mm. in the carbon dioxide breathing out. Yeah. Um, but if I don't breathe in deeply, you know, and have that uh, intake, then I have nothing to, to output. Yeah. Uh, there's just a couple of questions I like to ask at the end. Yeah. The first one is if you could go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would mm. you give? Man, I think I would say, I think <laughs> one of the things I'd say is it's all going to be okay in the end, yeah. you know, like <laughs> there was, um, the 21 year old version of me, I had been a Christian for two years was so, uh, strategic and anxious and, um, you know, programmed and planning, you know, I, I remember yeah. even at 21 thinking if I'm not married by 25, I'll kill myself. Cause man, that would just be the end of like, you know, I want to be, in, I want to be changed in the world for Christ. And that's going to start with having a wife. And so if I can't get that done by 25, you know, and of course the, the, yeah. I, the irony of a story I tell is that on my 25th birthday, I was surrendering that to God and realizing how silly that was. And my wife, who is simply just a, 
a, a grad student, you know, happened to be at the fire pit the night I had that realization. And I just always think of Jesus <laughs> laughing, going, yeah, I, I needed to get you yeah. here so you could surrender that. And now I'm going to introduce you to Kristen, you know, but uh, wow. um, yeah, I just, I think I see it in my own kids. You know, uh, our culture is just such a mm. anxiety producing comparison yep. driven. If you have mm -hmm. any of that Enneagram three achiever in you, which I do, I think I'd love to go back and say, it's all going to be okay. Yep. You know, it's all going to be okay in the end. And so um, you don't need to feel that burden as much, you know, yeah. which probably would make me a little stiller in the presence of Jesus, you know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I have that Enneagram three as well and I, <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. Um, I heard, uh, Ian Cron said once that the first half of your life is like the parable of the talents. Um, and the second half of your life is like the parable of the prodigal son as he's coming mm -hmm. home to figure out who he truly is. Um, and, uh, that that thing for me helps me and in a transition of like okay what do I want to do to slow down and and really figure out as a beloved son of God who who am I um, and that was yeah okay. yeah you're I mean just to to embrace that truth that you are already enough you know you're yeah. enough because he's enough and and to not have to go through life proving your value I think. Um, the, you know, I'm still struggling to learn that. So part of me is like, yeah. I, I would still say this to my 45 year old yeah. self, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, anything you've been reading or watching lately that you could recommend? Yeah. You know, um, one of the books that really kind of wrecked me recently, um, and let's see, I'm gonna get the title right. Cause then I taught on it for a little bit. Um, uh, it's called Unclean by Richard Beck, and he's mm -hmm. a, a professor um, at uh, maybe Asbury Seminary or something. But um, he really just walks through that Matthew 9 story of Jesus and the Pharisees and how they encounter um, Matthew's disciple, you know, sorry, Matthew's tax collector party mm -hmm. and the, yeah. the two postures, you know. And it's really a book about, you know, he frames it as a book about holiness and holiness through the grid of of purity and separation, which is the Pharisees going, Hey, we're so holy. We can't mm. be a part of this sin. So we have to stay out here. And Jesus reframing holiness through the lens of kind of missional engagement and saying, mm. actually my holiness is what is compelling me to go in there mm. because I, I believe that I have the power to positively influence them, you wow. know? And so he, he taught the, the metaphor that he talks a lot about is the idea of positive and negative contamination, you know, mm -hmm. even yeah. he uses the analogy of, you know, a, a, a drop of urine into a glass of lemonade makes you think I'm not drinking the lemonade, right? But if you put a drop of lemonade into a glass of urine, you still think I'm not drinking <laughs> this, right? <laughs> exactly. Because, because urine is a negative contaminant, no matter yeah. what it touches in your mind, it's now filthy. But Jesus is constantly using metaphors of positive contamination. Mm. So light, light in darkness. He says yep. just a little bit of light is more powerful than the darkness. Just a little bit of salt mm. flavors everything. Just a little bit of, of leaven impacts everything, right? Yeah. And, and the thing, and the value thing, and then it actually gets better, mm. you know, not worse. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it really impacted how I think about engagement with the world that mm. are, are we afraid that the world is gonna stain us Hmm. which is often the, the impulse in secularization. Don't go to yeah. Hollywood. They'll stain you. They'll, they'll ruin your family, yeah. right? Rather than the missional view of holiness, which is you need to go to Hollywood because you might help bring beauty there. Yeah. You know, and, and that is the scent impulse. And really, to me, the way of Jesus. So that, that book gave me such language. Hmm. That's called Unclean by Richard Beck. Yeah. I think that's great. I, I want to go check that out now. Uh, I also want to encourage everybody to go out and read Positively Irritating uh, by by John. Um, John, it was such a privilege to talk to you. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. Me too, Joshua. Hope we get to see each other in person. Yes. Soon here in the world of uh, conferences and gatherings. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, love, love to come see what you're all doing in Kansas City. Sounds good. Thanks, John. All right.